the top of the morning. How are you? Good. Someone pointed out last service that I should put my water bottle. She was actually disappointed that my water bottle wasn't in here. So I'm just going to do that now. Um, I learned a couple things during the news. It took me two times to see it to learn it. But one is that um, the Krabarushkas will be going to prison in the next couple of years. So make sure you spend some time with them because Lindsay doesn't do her taxes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And I had an idea, and I'm just going to put it out there. I think in response to the estrogen news, we should put Dan and Chad on the news together next week. <laughs> yeah. You won't get any news, but it'll be really entertaining. <laughs> should, should be stellar. Uh, <clears throat> and in, regarding the night skiing deal, part of the deal there is that started, a family went like, hey, we'd like to do this for Narrate so that they could serve their community that way. And so that's where that came from, and it's just kind of continued to happen and then the whole, like, if you're willing to help us be a teacher, that's for you, um, Great Divide snobs. You know who you are, those of you who won't ski there. Right? Awkward silence, <laughs> right? The idea is that you can come help other people learn how to ski. So you don't have to be a Great, great Divide ski snob that week. So let us know if you'll help us with that. That's awkward. Uh, so if you're guests, welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. We, we are a church. We believe that Jesus is who he says that he is, that in him is life and life at its best, and in the cross is salvation in ways not possible elsewhere. And yet uh, the way we orientate ourselves and the language we use is we talk about gathering and scattering. And I think the way I think about it is narrate really just does one thing, and that is we, we gather and we scatter this and then the other six days. And though that could easily be understood as two things coming together, uh, it, it's, it's not two things because if you take away one of them, we feel like you lose everything. So we value this and, and the opportunity it affords us with God and with others. And then we value the other six days, uh, both provoking you to, uh, I don't know, seize them. I feel like oftentimes what happens is all we have to do is validate them because we can live feeling guilty that we don't serve when in fact we have lots of opportunities in our everyday lives. And then periodically doing that together and the ski uh, trip would be, or ski trip, the night skiing would be one of those said opportunities, though a little more fun than most, perhaps. Uh, he also caught us in the third week of a four-week series called How, How to Be Rich. And we're calling this series How to Be Rich, not How to Get Rich, because what we've talked about already is that uh, you and I are surrounded every day by messages about how to get rich, and those aren't necessarily bad messages, and neither is getting rich necessarily a bad thing. But rarely are we provoked to think about how do we be rich. And what we've discovered is that many of us, probably most of us sometime back there, we already crossed the line from not rich to rich. But the problem is we don't really think in those terms. You know, like you don't, you're never going to show up and go like, at 1 a.m. or 1 p.m. on Tuesday, I went from not rich to rich. That's probably not going to happen. And so what we've said is, well, how, how, do you, how do you be rich? Because rich is a moving target. And if we don't realize that we're rich, then what happens is we continue to spend all of our energy on getting rich when all the while we already are rich, which means that we won't ever begin to answer the, like, how do I be responsible with wealth question. In fact, uh, what we discovered is it's kind of relative, this whole wealth deal, that, that they asked people who made $30,000 a year, how much would you have to make to, to be wealthy? And they said, well, if I made $75,000 a year, because if they doubled their income is what they're thinking. And if you can think back to when you were in high school or when you were newly married, you go, yeah, 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 75, man, woo. But if you make 75, you go, no, I'm not rich. I'm kind of poor, actually. I got kids in college and I got car payments and mortgages and all this stuff going on and I got an IRA to fund. I'm not rich. So they asked people who made 50 grand a year, what would it take for you to be rich? And they said, well, if we made about 100 grand a year, again, doubling their income. Then they asked people who were at the top of their income earning potential, okay, how much money do you have to make to be rich? And they said, ah, oh, millions. And you kind of go like, yeah, I guess so. You would be rich then, wouldn't you? Uh, but... The truth is this, if, if you make $37,000 a year, uh, 7 billion people on the planet, if you make $37,000 a year, you and your family, you're among 4% of the world population. Uh, if you make $45,000 a year, you're among 1%, which means like line up the 7 billion, and if your family uh, makes more than 45 grand a year, you're among 1% of the population which means that if you were to get together with uh, most people from most cultures and, and explain to them your, your style of life, your way of living, and your income, they would look at you and they'd go, man, you're rich. And so we said, well, let's spend some time asking, like, how do you, how do you be rich? Now, last week, uh, we started with this question. And I know it's like this love-hate thing, like, really, you're going to make me turn and talk to my wife for two minutes about this? I haven't talked to her in a week. Really, you're going to make me do that? So we're going to do that again a uh, different question this time. I, I want you to think about this. What is, what's the best piece of financial advice you've ever received? So it's not really fair because you've had like 10 seconds and I've had 10 weeks, but what's the best piece of financial advice you've ever received? And then part B, uh, did you take it? 
Right? Turn and talk amongst yourselves. Okay, how you doing? Am I cutting you off too early? The uh, best piece of financial advice I ever received was actually dates back to, uh, I'm, I was hanging out with my grandpa, and he said, uh, Adam, whatever you do, don't ever bet money on the Denver Broncos. totally kidding. Actually, though, the best, uh, the best advice I ever received, I was listening to a podcast, because if you do what I do, then you're a student of communication and a good stealer of ideas. And I was listening to this podcast several years ago, probably close to a decade ago now, and I remember where I was. I was still living in Billings, and I was running next to Dallas Stadium. You don't care, but that's the way my mind works. And, and I was listening to the, one of my favorite communicators in the world, one of the, my favorite leaders in the world, and it was a marriage series. And he said, uh, he was sharing that when he advises young couples or couples period who are looking to get married, he said, uh, the most important decision you can ever make. And he kind of tease it out. Like, you know what the most important decision you can ever make before you get married? And he said, it doesn't have to do with like how many days or how many Sundays a month you go to church. It doesn't have to do with how many kids you'll have or whether you're homeschooling your kids or not. It doesn't have to do with whether or not you'll do couple devotions or read books together. And some of you are going like, Phew. Um, it doesn't have to do with any of that stuff. He said, the most important decision you can make. Now, this is a guy who uh, has experience, right? a seasoned veteran when it comes to journeying with families and marriages who understands that the number one cause of America, uh, number one ca cause of divorce in America is what? Money. He said the most important decision you can make before you get married is what percentage of your income are you going to live off? And he went on to explain uh, that, that you, can, you can pick 110. I mean, some people do, lots of people do. You can introduce Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover into your life. You can live on 110, 120% of your income. And you don't necessarily think of it in those terms, but that's what you do. He said, you can live on 100. You can just say like, okay, so whether we make 30 grand a year or 300 grand a year, we're going to live off of everything we make and we'll just adjust accordingly. And then of course, his advice, and here's the best piece of advice I've ever received, is he said 80%. In his mind, the ceiling, the absolute maximum percent you should live off of in his view was 80%. He said, you should give 10 you should save 10. And if you'll do that, and his experience is what he was saying, uh, your marriage and the likelihood of it making it will go up uh, quite dramatically. Now, second part of the question, did I receive it? Uh, actually, quite the contrary, I bristled. Because at this point in my life, um, I was a part of this group of friends, and we were really fired up about international justice and sex trafficking and building wells in Africa. And so we took a lot of pride. I took a lot of pride. My wife and I took a lot of pride in giving to those types of things. In fact, we took pride in the fact that I'm not bragging. I'm actually saying this because I'm realizing it was unhealthy, my view at the time. But like, we took a lot of pride in the fact that we gave 13% at the time. But the bristling part, that was the saving part. In fact, I remember having a, a conversation with a friend. Uh, I saw Johnny, remember this Johnny, where we were, uh, he was sharing with me how, sorry, I just kind of tipped my hand of Johnny's personal life, but he was sharing with me how he and his wife had this emergency fund and it had several, uh, uh, several thousand dollars, you know, monthly, several months emergency savings in it, excuse me. And I remember getting in this kind of heated discussion with him and he told me about this whack job, Dave Ramsey, who was telling him to do this stuff. And I remember saying like that, like that is unholy. I don't know that I use that words, but my argument was simply this, like that's not right because there are people starving in Africa. And if you would free that money up, that money could, you could leverage that money and they could eat tomorrow. That's where I was. And then uh, this is kind of the way life goes, right? Shortly thereafter, I think just a couple of days and I was still thinking about this because you know when you're confronted with, uh, maybe for you this is this series and if not this series, maybe it'll be this morning where there's someone that, Yet you kind of respect, but you disagree with them, that tension. And that's where I was with this guy. And a couple days later, I was driving my family vehicle. We had two little babies at the time, and our family vehicle was a 1996 Subaru Outback. And I was driving it with this high school kid in the front seat, which is obvious, like you wouldn't put a high school student in the back seat. But um, I remember looking down, this high mileage vehicle, looking down in the thermometer gauge was like way past the H. And I don't know much about cars, but I knew that was bad. So I can't remember whether I parked the car or whether I nursed the thing home or whatever. And then I called a friend of mine who uh, sold some cars and he had, you know, inside, like the type of mechanic that you all want to find, the one that's really good but doesn't charge like he's really good, that type of guy. And he told me about this guy who only works on Subarus. And so I took it to him and he called me the next day and he said, uh, Adam, head gasket. Didn't know what a head gasket was, but all of you just went, ugh. <laughs> Especially if you drive a Subaru, like, ugh. $1,200, he said. Or he said, and he began to explain to me that like the, the 2.5 liter Subaru engine is a lemon and this happens all the time. And he said, so if you want uh, $1,200 to replace the head gasket or $1,500, I'll put a 2.2 in there. It's used, but I've been through it and those are bulletproof. So either way, I remember hanging up going like, I don't have $1,200 and I certainly don't have $1,500. 
which was a little bit shaming, frankly, because there was no excuse. I had a good job, and we didn't have mountains of debt, and my wife was a nurse, and she worked some, and so uh, we weren't poor. And we had kids, and, you know, like we, weren't, we wouldn't have thought ourselves as rich, but we were rich, but we certainly weren't poor. And then the next day, I believe, I was walking with a good friend of mine, and we were walking along the rims, and we were talking about, uh, you know, just kind of sharing life, and I was sharing with him this whole crazy deal about the motor, and we had talked prior about savings and retirement and all this stuff. And he showed up at the door the next day, Someone knocked on the door and there was this envelope in his hand uh, with 15 $100 bills in it. Now, uh, that was confronting because this was someone that I liked and uh, admired and like he has it, but I don't. What made it all the more confronting was the fact that like he, he was, he's kind of one of those beaten it guys that likes to recreate and likes to lot, have lots of fun but doesn't necessarily have a desire to own much. Is a tradesman, works hard, and I thought, wow, huh. So I don't believe in savings but I'm willing to capitalize on other people's savings. <laughs> and, and that, of course, provoked more conversation. And, and, and I remember then, Teresa and I began, we just began to think about our finances and we began to think about this really uncomfortable idea of like, is God's blessing on our finances, which I know is crazy churchy and yet crazy true oftentimes. And, and we started to look at that 13%. And what we began to realize is, yeah, we prided ourselves on, we get, on giving 13%. But the reality is we gave like three because like we had this and we still do, we had the separate account, like 13% went into the separate account. We called it our giving account and we gave from that. And, but like very little of that ended up uh, in, a, in a place where we didn't benefit directly from. In fact, I was on staff at a church and, and you know, 10% tithe, not even close. We justified, you know, we bought pizzas for people when they came over and all kinds of ministry type stuff. You'd go, you'd have coffee with somebody, you'd, you'd buy them a coffee. It, and what we realized is, yeah, we say we give 13, but... Like the amount that we give that we don't directly benefit from, not even close. And, and so we, we, back to the vice, we just kind of went like, what if we try it? And the phrasing that I used was, what if we get legalistic about this and just say first 10, saving, next 10, giving, and the next 10 is going all to the church. And, and you know, we, we believe in doing all this extra stuff too in Africa and all that stuff too. And we just made this decision like anything extra we do from above and beyond that. And I got to tell you, um, awkward though it might be to say it, we, we've, we've never looked back. And that, like, and to be honest with you, we're, we're nowhere near 80% right now. Just never looked back. Now, as weird as that is to talk about in church, that, that's kind of the heart of this series is to go, you know what, this whole rich thing, uh, it comes with a lot of responsibility. This whole American thing, this whole, like, resource wealth thing that we have going on, it comes, well, it's hard, frankly. It's difficult. It's difficult when you look at the Bible. It's difficult when you look at your neighbor. It's difficult when you look at your coworker. And so we just kind of went like, let's, let's, let's talk about it. And probably most of you in those conversations, you had great things to say and we could put them on a piece of paper and we could publish it and we could hand it out and we could say like, have a good morning because like the principles are rich. So that's what we're doing. Now, if you haven't been with us, what's driving this series and what you may not know about what's driving this series is that there are places in the Bible where God says, hey, I just want to talk to rich people. He just gets one-on-one -on -one with rich people, so to speak, and says, I want to talk to him. He says in James, James, warn the rich people. Jesus himself at one point said, uh, hey, those of you that are rich, he doesn't say you can't be saved. He says it'll be a lot more difficult for you to trust God than it will for those non-rich people. And what we're looking at is, is a chunk from uh, 1 Timothy where the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, who is this young up-and-coming leader, and he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, when you get with the rich people, got to help them think about this. And I got to tell you, I like so relate to Timothy because I, I imagine that Timothy felt some of the same tensions that I feel and that we feel like, wait a minute, I don't want to talk about money. Like we've, we've got people in there. They're a part of this conversation and we might alienate them if we talk about money. And Paul goes, Timothy, you got, you have to talk to the rich people. So that's what we're doing. So in the first week, uh, we, we, this, these three verses we're working through, we just talked about this idea that like he says to Timothy, like, tell them they're rich. Like, they might not know they're rich, which has kind of been the conversation we've had. And then last week, uh, he, he brings up this tension that I think is as old as the human experience, where he says, warn them, the tension, uh, the temptation will be for them to lean, to put their hope in their stuff. And their hope and their stuff can't give them hope. It can't give them security, but they'll try. And then what will happen is they'll lose their marriage or their kid will run off or their health will go bad. And then they'll realize it can't give them security. Tell them before that happens. Like, I want to talk to him before it happens. This week, we're going to work on verse 18. 
so let's just read the chunk and then we'll just kind of start breaking it down. It's kind of a light weekend, if you haven't been able to tell. Uh, sarcastic joke, not caught. <laughs> command, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Here's this week. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. One question I have for you, like if you check out and you're going to take a nap or whatever, it was a hard day skiing yesterday. Here's the one question that I just feel like this text begs us to ask. Is what if being good at being rich, what if being good at being rich requires that we pre-decide from our time and our money what we're going to give? What if rich people don't have the luxury of spontaneity because rich people are so rich in options that if they just rely upon spontaneity to give of their time and their money, it'll never happen? What if, what if being good at being rich involve, involves pre-deciding to give time and money to certain things? Start it out. Command them to do good. Now, notice he doesn't say be good. Most of the Bible talks to us about being good. That's not at all what he's saying here. Uh, being good happens in Christ. He's saying, tell the rich people to do good. In other words, tell the rich people to do good in, only, in, in the way only rich people can. Like, tell the rich people to, to recognize their margins and recognize the extra that they have and to see that as an opportunity to do good. Command them to, to do good, to be rich, in good deeds. Uh, here's one way of thinking about this. What if Paul is saying, I don't want you to be average people good. I don't want you to do average people good. I want you to do rich people good. I don't want you to just like do what, what average people can do. You're rich. You can do way more. Do what they can do. Because rich people, they have more than non-rich people do. Duh, right? Like rich people, they have extra time. Ever thought of that? Like, uh, most of you probably have two days off a week. Some of you have three. Uh, like just stop and think about that. Like, that in the human experience, and even in this culture in some regards, uh, well, in the human experience, uh, that's rare, unheard of, unfounded. What was the cry of the Israelites in Exodus? We don't get a day off. My wife and I were watching The Help last Sunday night. I can admit that I watched The Help, even though it's branded to chicks. It's very good. Very good movie. Have you watched it? You should watch it. It'll make you feel like a heel is what it'll do. Um, that's what it did to me. Anyway, so The Help is about African-American women who lived in the supposed free South and act as housekeepers for white people. What I didn't know, um, well, as I was watching that, one of the things that one of the housekeepers, one of the comments she made was that the, her only day off was Sunday. And I remember subconsciously going like, Wow. I mean, how do you have your own life when you're already raising other people's kids and all that stuff? How do you have your own life when sun up to sundown, you're in someone else's house and your only day off is Sunday? Whoa. See, rich people, we have extra time. We have days off. We also have vacation. Like many of us, probably most of us, we have a week or two or sometimes three weeks a year where our boss says, hey, check this out. You go do something else and we'll pay you. And if you took most other cultures and said, yeah, the Americans, they do this thing where like, they get to go to California and then their work pays them, they would go, well, that's dumb because the math doesn't add up. Paul's going, yeah, you have extra time. But do you know uh, data now, not opinion, that as someone's extra time increases, as people become richer and richer and richer in time, the percentage of that time that they use to serve others goes down? Like if you were to take America and, and like the more extra time someone has, the less of it they give to others. Why? Well, if you think about it, like rich people have options. They have things to do, places to go, right? They have, they have hobbies to engage in. They have ski hills to visit. They have relatives to go visit. They have like bucket lists of these activities they want to accomplish in their life. Rich people, they sit down and they go, we have all this extra time. What are we going to do with our extra time? Let's do something that would be enjoyable with our extra time. And Paul goes, tell the rich people that if they're not careful, they'll get to the end of the year and they'll realize they've spent all their extra time on themselves. Tell the rich people that if they're not careful, they'll get to the end of their lives and, and God will go, hey, were you rich in good deeds? And they'll go, 
Who has time for that? Like, I'm busy. See, see Paul's saying, uh, command the rich people to be rich in good deeds, to, to take some of their extra time and to leverage it and use it to serve others. And we know this from experience, right? Because we'll, we'll do all these things. We'll go skiing. How was the skiing? It was good. We'll go to a restaurant. How was the restaurant? It was good. We'll go on vacation. How was the re- vacation? It was good. But then, like, you'll go to a summer camp and you'll serve. Or you'll spend a Saturday serving somebody else. And you'll go, like, how was that? It was awesome. And, 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 and those experiences can drive us for a long time. Paul's saying, tell the rich people to be rich in good deeds, to use some of their extra time. And then he goes on. And to be generous and willing to share. Charity. He's saying, give some of their finances to others. And then we go, well, I give. I give. And I think here's where, where Paul goes, no, 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 no. Tell, tell, him, tell him to give like only rich people can give. To tell them to be careful that they don't allow all the margin to be used on themselves. Tell them to be rich in good deeds and rich in being generous and willing to give to others. Did you know that the higher percentage of someone's household income, the higher of someone's household income, the lower the percentage that they give is? That, that what you, percentage-wise, what the average couple gives when they're 25 and barely making it is more than what they give when they're in their 40s and 50s and making six figures. It's not opinion, that's just data. That as this goes, this goes. And again, we go, why? Well, I think in some ways there's, think of it this way. Like when you were, some of you were raised in the church and your dad taught you when you were three years old, like with every dollar you give a dime, right? What can you do with a dime anyway? With every $10 you give a dollar. With every $100 you give 10. What can you do with $10? With every 1000 you give 100 And that, for many of us, is like when we reach our giving threshold. Like we've arrived when we're writing checks that are in the hundreds. But a 1000 out of 10000 I can do something with a thousand, can't you? Ten thousand out of a hundred thousand? There goes the nineteen ninety six Subaru Outback. <laughs> like we can buy cars. I mean that those are those are good vacations, ten thousand dollar vacations. A, a, a hundred thousand out of a million? Dude, that's an education. That's a vacation house. That's a paid off mortgage. See, rich people, what's true of our time is true of our money. We live in a culture that's rich in options, and there's always going to be something else to drive and some, always something else to wear and always something else to eat and always somewhere else to visit and always new gear to have and always new trinkets to buy. There's always going to be new technology. Paul says, tell the rich people to be careful because they have extra, and what happens is they, they use all the extra on themselves unless they're intentional. Tell them to, to be rich in good deeds and generous. Now, uh, if I could just try to be the critic in your head, like who here really feels like they have extra time or money? Like when's the last time you sat around and went like, yeah, I have two days off. I've got nothing to do. It doesn't happen. It's, it's rare, right? Like we, we don't, we don't, I mean, it doesn't happen all that often. When someone comes to your house, uh, well, 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 first, let me say this, which is what brings us back to that big idea. What if being rich in good deeds and rich in generosity requires that you predecide? What if spontaneity will ruin the rich person's ability to be rich in good deeds? What if it'll ruin their ability to, to be generous? Think of it this way. When someone comes to your house for dinner, do you, do you open the fridge and go, hey, what are we going to eat? Well, we got some leftovers. Got some nappy carrots here. We could eat some nappy carrots. Got some, I don't know if this is spaghetti sauce or chili. Would you like some chili? Got some corn. Nothing like canned corn. Would you like some canned corn? It's silly to even suggest that we would do this, right? What if, what if when you don't pre-decide, what if by default what you give is leftovers? That's not a shaming statement. That's not a condemning statement. It's just the reality that when, when you don't pre-decide, well, the only thing you're left to give is leftovers. And like, who gets the leftovers in your house? You do. That's the intention. So, so what does it look like to, to pre-decide with our time? Let's just try to get nuts and bolts practical here. Well, let's just go back to those couple days off a week. What, what if you went like, 
I'm not just going to spontaneously serve. I'm not just going to go like, yeah, I feel like serving tomorrow. Or I'm not just going to show up and go, hey, how can I help? I feel like serving today. What if you went like, I got a couple days a week. I'm going to budget some time where I serve somebody else. Pick an organization. Pick a church. I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of different ways you could do that. There are some fantastic organizations in town. What if you just said, like, I'm going to give three hours a day. I'm going to go help in my kid's class. I don't know. There's lots of different ways to do this. But to pre-decide, I'm going to give some of my time to these people. You can think of it this way. You know why you love coming here? You know why this is, uh, for some of you, and I don't mean this egotistically, but why, why this is such a good experience for you? Because lots of people have pre-decided to give some of their time to make this gathering fantastic. They, they didn't wake up and go like, hey, I think I'll serve. They decided all of our schedules go three months out. They decided months ago, I can give a half, I can give Sunday morning X number of Sundays in every three months. They, I, they pre-decided from the guy who pulls the trailer at 5.30 in the morning to the guy who helps set up to the people who run sound from 7 in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon to ushers and greeters. And then there's those kids people who like they work harder than me because they teach kids for 75 minutes. I'm exhausted, you. And then they come to service. I mean, you, you love being a part of this. And I'm not using this to shame you or manipulate you just to kind of create an example. You love this because not because people spontaneously give, which is what rich people are prone to do, but because they pre-decided, here's what I'm going to give. Here's what I can do. What if you were to pre-decide how to give some of your days off? And then there's your vacation. Uh, this was an idea that was <clears throat> new to me and introduced to me, and I, I really like it in my family, and I was actually working on implementing it. Say you get three weeks. What if you had fun for two of those and, and you serve somebody with a third? Say you get 10 days. What if you said six of those, we're going to go do something fun? And four of those, we're, we're going to go help at a youth camp. We're going to go help at a soup kitchen. We're going to drive to Denver or Portland or Seattle, and we're going to do this thing or that thing there. Like, What, what if you just said, like, I'm rich in extra time? And I want to use it to serve some others. Uh, my family and I is working on this in, Jan, in June. I've got to go to Portland, or I don't have to. I get to, but there's a church that I need to go, want to go spend some time with, need, want, right? You catch that. Uh, and so we're going like, yeah, let's, let's screw around. Let's play for a couple of days. And then I'm working with a friend there that is trying to connect us with a way that our family can just serve for a couple of days. And, and you're thinking what I'm thinking already, like, well, it's not really serving. You'll have more fun serving than you will at the amusement park. Exactly, Right? You have extra time. Paul's going, tell them, tell them to be rich in good deeds, to, to use it for others. Because you know what you miss out on when you serve spontaneously? Jesus has this principle where he says, if you want your heart to go somewhere, send your time and your money there. Like, you want your heart to, to be passionate about big brothers, big sisters, give them some money. You want your heart to be passionate about the gospel, uh, leverage some money for it. When, you, when, you're, when you're spontaneous, you miss out on the heart piece. Because people who go like, yeah, I'll, I'll teach kids at 9 o'clock every Sunday. And then you go up to them and you go, thank you. And they go, thank you? What are you smoking? Thank you. You don't need to thank me. No, you don't need, sorry for the reference. You, 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 don't, you don't need to thank me. Like, this is awesome. Why? Because I gave it some time and so their heart goes there. And when you're a spontaneous giver, server, I think you miss out on the heart piece. And, and, and what does it look like? Uh, to pre-decide with our generosity, with our resources. You know how rich people do it? They pick a percentage. And that percentage is gone before it hits the bank account. Some people even have a separate checking account and they just transfer it right into that separate account. Rich people, they pre-decide that we're going to take X percentage of what we make and we are just going to send it in another direction. They pick other organizations. And so what if... What if you were to pick an organization too and go, we're just going to, we're going to pre-decide that this percentage is going to them. Can I challenge you not to pick 18 organizations though? Like, like pick your church, pick an organization, pick, pick two or three things. Don't, don't pick 18. Don't do the spontaneous like, oh, that was a good, that was a good letter that I received. Oh, that was a good thing that I heard. Oh, that guy in the corner looks pathetic. I mean, don't, 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 I, I understand what we're doing there, but can I just challenge you to be more intentional than that? Pick a couple and be, be rich 
in generosity. So some of you, maybe it's as simple as start tithing. Start at 5%, 10%, 15%. Some of you could go higher than that and just say like there is this money and it's going somewhere else and some of it's going to our church and somewhere, some of it's going somewhere else. And you go, boy, Adam, this is really convenient. I go, if you don't trust me, because I get it, like I understand, I've been sitting where you are and I've heard the same message, I get that, then don't do it here. That's fine. But if God is who I believe that he is, and who you believe that he is, he's not so interested just in the stuff. He's saying, I want to teach you how to be a good, rich person. And there's this principle, like take a percentage and send it somewhere else. Could I meddle a little bit more? Some of you, you picked 10% when you were three years old, and now you're 43 years old and it's still 10%. Some of you, you... You, you picked 7% when you first got married, and now you've been married for 15 years, and it's still 7%. What else do you do the same way that you did it 40 years ago? What, what else do you do the same way that you did it when you were first married? Uh, I had a friend introduce me several years ago to the concept of increasing my percentage every year, and I'm not saying that it's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. And I have friends who are geniuses at finances, and they say it's not financially sustainable. But then I have friends going like, okay, whatever. So, so, if you're someone that's like, yep, got it, got it. Maybe, maybe the challenge for you is like, up the ante a bit. And could I meddle a little bit more? <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll talk about something much more warm like boundaries in February. Um, I understand the argument of we give, we just don't give to the church. I, I get that. I understand it. I've been there. I've been there, meaning like way back to when I heard the 80% thing, I've been there, and I've been there, I've sat across from the table, and I've heard the argument. I understand the argument of like, yeah, we believe in giving, we just don't believe that the tithe is in the Bible and it all has to go to the church. I don't either. But if I could challenge you, most people who use that argument are hiding behind the fact that they're not really giving that much. And I know that sounds harsh, but, but, but if you're someone that's like, yeah, we, we, we give, and I would challenge you to just wonder if, if, if it doesn't look like a lot like it looked like for my wife and I some five or ten years ago when we went like, yeah, we, it's really become another revenue stream for us. We have friends over and we buy pizza. And so, so before you go like, yeah, 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 we give, I guess I would just challenge you to go like, are you? Or is it a new budget line item for you? And I mean, is it really benefiting others? Okay, I'll drop that. I'll just land here. Can you imagine... Can you imagine how much different the perception of Christians would be in our community if Christians did this? And, and I know that sounds, uh, well, critical because lots of you are doing it. But could you imagine how much different the perception of Christ followers would be in our community if we were doing this? Can you hate somebody who shows up and serves you when your husband leaves you? Can you hate somebody who brings you a meal when your wife just had a baby? Can you hate somebody who writes you a check for new tires because they recognize that yours are bald and you're a single mom? Can you hate somebody who, who meets your need even though you disagree with their beliefs? We started a church a couple years ago and we said, let's call ourselves Narrate because we don't think that we have anything new to say. We think we have a story to tell by the way we serve others. And to that end, I think we've done well. That, that we believe that the greatest mechanism for introducing people to Jesus and, and reintroducing people to Jesus wasn't a message and it was nothing I would say and it was nothing that would be on a podcast. It was nothing that anybody hadn't already heard. It was telling a different story through our generosity. And you love this place. If you love this place, you do it because some rich people have said, hey, we're going to pre-decide to give some of our time and we're going to pre-decide to give some of our money. Can you imagine how much different the perception of Christianity would be if we said, I'm rich. And so I'm not just going to spontaneously do it. I'm going to budget it. Now, if you're someone here that's intrigued, in G with intri intrigued by Jesus or maybe even re-engaged in the conversation, uh, I just want you to know like that's possible because some rich people pre-decided and the gospel says you don't earn my you don't earn God's grace you don't earn his favor you you can't you can't crawl your way up to heaven the gospel is grace and then the gospel compels 
us to be giving as God is giving. That's the story and that's the way that we tell the story. The medium becomes the message. I know this is heavy and there's lots to process and think about and decide whether or not you'll ever come back here. So let me, let me pray and then the band's going to come up and lead us in a couple songs and just give you some time to noodle. God, God, accepting that we're rich is hard enough. We live in a culture, God, that's not going to reinforce the message that it's not all for us. And there are people here this morning that what they need is a giant slap on the back and a good job because they've been walking this path with you for some time. And I pray that as they look around and they see the energy and, and they see what's going on and they, they see the story being told that, that they would know that they own a piece of that, that they're a part of that. And God, there's some here that I suspect you, you want to provoke us and challenge us and just turning that over to your spirit that you would stomp out the words that aren't of you and what would follow this would be some great conversations uh, among friends and couples we love you Jesus it's in your name that we pray